It's been called the Big Muddy and America's River. For centuries, it's fed mankind, been a roadway to new lands, and a provider of jobs. It's also home to a diverse range of wildlife, some of whose ancestors predate the dinosaurs. Hi, I'm Jim Wilhelm. Today we're visiting the National Mississippi River Museum and Aquarium in Dubuque, Iowa. Here visitors can learn about the river's vast natural resources, explore issues facing its use, and learn about our history on its waters. The first humans to thrive along the Mississippi River Bank were of course the Native Americans. On display are several pieces of pottery unearthed at village sites, along with one of the first types of river crafts to be used, a dugout canoe. Later came the Europeans, mostly the French, trappers searching for animal pelts and missionaries to convert the Indians. This silver monstrance for the communion host was excavated from a site where Marquette oversaw a mission till his death in 1675. But the greatest influx of settlers into this area came about because of the discovery of lead ore. Behind me is a reproduction of an underground lead mine that visitors can explore. Those mines were turning out three million pounds of lead per year. This output helped establish Dubuque as one of the most important settlements on the Mississippi River. Here's a money belt from 1845, worn when the miner exchanged his lead for gold. And this is a five dollar note from the Miner's Bank, established in 1837. It was in existence longer than any other early Iowa bank. Lead made Dubuque an important shipping port, and that in turn led to more river traffic, and that meant steamboats. Here visitors could view artifacts from a number of those boats and learn about onboard life during the golden age of steam. Most people envision river travel back then involving state rooms and elegant meals in grand salons. Yet the majority of passengers would book space on the main deck where the animals and cargo were stored. Deck passage was only half the cost of a private room, but you got only space, no food, no bed, and the deck passengers had to assist in carrying the wood on board. Oh, and the, uh, the term stateroom, that comes from the old tradition of naming the private rooms after states in the Union. And as river traffic increased, Dubuque became home to another industry. For over a hundred years, this town was the most important boat building center on the Mississippi River, a heritage celebrated at this museum. In fact, the museum is located in one of the last remaining buildings of the Dubuque Boat and Boiler Works. And outside, its grounds are sprinkled with displays, taking visitors through the process of making and launching a riverboat. Known as the Dubuque Ice Harbor, it was dug by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers beginning in 1882 as a winter harbor for the upper Mississippi River boats. Once the harbor opened, the Dubuque Boat and Boiler Works moved to this location. It was the largest inland water boat builder in the country. They made torpedo boats for the Spanish-American War, they made sub-chasers for World War I, and they even made several vessels for the railroad navies. Called transfer boats, they were huge vessels used to ferry locomotives and train cars in places where the river was too wide for bridges. Each one cost a quarter of a million dollars and had six boilers powering two side wheel engines. But those were not the largest vessels ever ordered. In 1901, the Sprague was launched from this site. It was the largest steam towboat ever built. It was 318 feet long, and it was used to push coal barges. Nicknamed Big Mama, she set the record for the longest tow, pushing 56 coal barges from Pittsburgh to New Orleans. Her stern wheel was 40 feet wide and could turn at a pace of 11 revolutions per minute. Just to give you an idea of the scope of the equipment installed here, I'm standing in front of two steam generators. Each one of them weighs 50 tons, and they were both installed in a dredge boat built in 1932. 
The smokestacks, which were added after the launch, rise up to 40 feet. But not everything on display at the museum has a connection with the boatyard. On a different scale is this towboat. It's a reminder of how the river was sometimes a family affair. This boat was built from scratch between the years of 1938 and 1940 by the Logsdon family for use in their sand and gravel business. On board, three generations lived and worked. Measuring 95 feet in length, it was built to take a beating. The hull is made of planks of Douglas red fir, three inches thick. It was powered by a direct reversing diesel engine, which meant the pilot had to shut it off before shifting into reverse. One of the most popular attractions here is a William M. Black, a side wheeler which is open to the public. It was the last steam powered dredge boat to work the river. The Black was built in 1934 and is now one of only a handful of preserved historic dredges once used by the U.S. Corps of Engineers. These levers operated the dredge head, or the dustpan. It operated like a giant vacuum cleaner, removing the sand and mud from the bottom of the river channel. This boat operated 24 hours a day, with a crew of 60 people working three shifts. During a single day, this boat could remove up to 80,000 cubic yards of material, which was carried through a pipeline under the decks to the stern. There it exited with enough power to be run through pipes floating on a series of barges which could be up to a quarter of a mile in length. Inside, visitors could tour not only the engine room but the upper deck as well, where the men slept and ate. It's called the Boar's Nest and it had accommodations for 32 men. The men signed up for the entire season, which ran from spring until early November. At the other end of the boat is the captain's cabin, complete with a set of speaking tubes to stay connected with the pilot house. And this is the galley where cooks prepared four meals a day for the three shifts. Meals were at 7, noon, 5 p.m., and midnight. The galley and the mess are still in use today because the black has become a boat and breakfast. Individuals or groups can book a stateroom or their cruise quarters for overnight accommodations and in the morning be served a hearty breakfast. The Black fulfilled its mission from 1934 to 1973 when the high cost of fuel forced its retirement. Today it's a reminder of the power of steam and of the men who worked on the river. In front of the Black is a natural wetland area where visitors can walk along a raised boardwalk to gaze at the wildlife. The museum is an interpretive center of the Upper Mississippi Wildlife and Fish Refuge, and it's a great place to experience some of its diversity. In addition, there are various buildings along the path, from a historic cabin to this recreation of a Native American wikiup. It's a temporary hunting shelter set up for the winter and could house up to 12 men for several days. As we've seen, this facility takes us from the time of the Native Americans to the golden age of steamboats. But it's the National Mississippi River Museum and Aquarium. The Mississippi story does not end at the water's edge. The Mississippi River is a huge expanse and it does cover a great many habitats and ecosystems. Uh, a number of the animals are common throughout that range, so it is a very complex story to tell. The way that the exhibit is set up, you have five large main ecotypes that you're introduced to. As you walk into the building, you, the first one that you come in contact with is the backwater marsh, and this is the um, backwater area, the shallow, warmer water areas where a lot of fish go to spawn. Uh, you have a lot of waterfowl, uh, so greater diversity of smaller fish in that habitat. Uh, what I have behind me here is the main channel tank. It's the largest uh, aquarium in the Mississippi River Museum. Uh, it's about 30,000 gallons and we have about 20 species of fish, all of which are found in the Mississippi River. A lot of people are very surprised to know that these animals are in the river. Uh, they tend to look at these fish and think 
Um, unusual fish like that are only found in South America or Africa, but uh, we have some very unique and exciting animals right here in our own backyard. As you can see the paddlefish, uh, he's in the process of sifting food through the water column and that's what they do in the wild. They uh, swim around with their mouth open and uh, sift food through the out of the water like whales do. Uh, that paddle is covered with tiny electroreceptors that help it find the uh, plankton and small animals that it filters out of the water. Yes, we have uh, two types of gars in this exhibit. Uh, those are long-nosed gar and short-nosed gar. I think one thing that really impresses people a lot are the catfish. Uh, we have some very large catfish. We have a couple of blue catfish. One of them is just over 100 pounds. And people are very impressed with those guys, since we all hear the stories about the giant catfish in the Mississippi River. One of the uh, more unusual things we have in this exhibit is an albino snapping turtle. It was actually a gift from the Philadelphia Zoo a few months ago. We have a, a river otter right now, and you can take a look at her. She's right over, over here. Uh, they were in a great deal of trouble and were hunted extensively over the years. Um, Il Iowa, Illinois, Missouri, and several other states started bringing river otters up from Louisiana to reintroduce them into this area, and it's been very successful. Uh, river otters are extremely playful and very popular. The kids love them. And then uh, the next major exhibit that you run into is the bayou, and that's where we start talking about some of the subtropical habitats that the Mississippi runs into. We have an uh, eight-foot-long American alligator, a female, and we also have several juvenile alligators that we use for education programs. We have cow-nose rays, and those are from the Gulf of Mexico, and they occasionally do swim a little ways up the river to as far north as Lake Pontchartrain just north of New Orleans. There are various types of rays. The cow nose rays are more of a um, open water fish. They, they swim up in the water column more. They don't tend to spend a lot of time sitting on the bottom. The wet lab is a very exciting part of the museum and you can go in there and get up close and personal with some of the more unusual animals found in the river like crayfish, mussels, snails. Uh, we have uh, pelts and skins from various animals that you can touch. And there's an educator on hand to uh, answer any of your questions. I think what I would like to see people come away with is a deeper appreciation of the river and the things that live in and around the river. Uh, so often we tend to think of conservation and wildlife in terms of the plains of Africa or the jungles of South America when really we have this wonderfully diverse ecosystem right here in our own backyards. This museum was recently named an affiliate to the Smithsonian Institute and as such now has access to the Institute's vast collection. Not only that, this museum is also home to the National Rivers Hall of Fame. It's an organization whose goal is to preserve the history of the men and women who've left their mark on America's river. On display are artifacts from some of the recipients of the Achievement Award. Throughout the Hall of Fame are computer terminals allowing visitors to read about the individual inductees. It's information that is also accessible through the museum's website. We've chosen Mary Green, who married Captain Green in 1890. By standing watch with her husband, she learned the trade, and she received a pilot's license six years later. They eventually bought the Delta Queen, and she was a captain of that prestigious boat until she passed away in 1949 in her cabin. In addition to the computer terminals, there are three theaters that relate portions of the river's history. There are also interactive displays which explore issues facing the waterways today. And for aspiring pilots, there's a towboat simulator. Straight ahead. Just be careful about the current. It's going to push you to the right. As we've seen, this facility is about the people, history, and animal life that surround America's greatest river. For more information about the National Mississippi River Museum and Aquarium, call 1-800-226-3369. 
or go to their website at www.rivermuseum.com.